All right. Is everything okay? Do you see my, my slides? Yeah, you're ready to go. Thank you. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank the company of biologists and Alex uh, for the very kind introduction and also for the uh, wonderful opportunity to be here today to share with you um, my work uh, that revolves around cilia, polycysteine, and mechano sensation in left right patterning. So, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit of why we're interested in a left right patterning. So we are, as despite an apparent external symmetry, a vertebrate exhibit a striking left-right asymmetry in the structure and in the position of their internal organs. We, for instance, the heart and the stomach uh, on the left and the liver on the right side. And defect of left-right asymmetry typically fall in the spectrum of a syndrome uh, called heterotaxy, which is defined by the abnormal uh, arrangement of internal thoracoabdominal organs across the left-right axis of the body. And uh, when you have a complete reversal of the organ position and structure, you're completely fine. It's called you know, situs inversus. But whenever you end up with a slight um, uh, abnormal arrangement, you fall under the spectrum uh, of heterotaxy. And heterotaxy is not a, a trivial syndrome, as it's typically associated with a cardiovascular malformation. And to illustrate uh, how important proper lateralization is, uh, heterotaxy 90% of patients born with heterotaxy are also born with the most uh, survivable, the most common survival birth defect, which is congenital heart disease, which results from the uh, abnormal heart uh, development. So now that we know that proper lateralization uh, is important, where does it all uh, start and how does it take place? Um, so it all starts, oops, sorry in a ciliated and transient structure called the left-right uh, organizer. So the left-right organizer is a structure conserved across vertebrates. And you probably heard of it uh, because uh, like under different names, as it's called the embryonic node in the mouse or the Anson's node in the chick or the cupus basicle in zebrafish. And uh, here I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the main steps that take place to break the initial uh, left-right symmetry. And the first step is the formation of cilia in the structure. Uh, cilia will beat to generate a leftward flow. This flow will be transduced on the left side, which will ultimately lead to a release of calcium on the left side that will be translated in a cascade of gene expression called the nodal cascade, which will ultimately lead to proper organ situs. And despite extensive work that have been done over the years to understand and characterize all those steps, there are still some gaps remaining in this model, especially regarding how the flow is being transduced and understanding it has been the main focus of my work. So now to address this gap, let me please go back to the first two steps of the model. So as I told you, cilia, uh, the structure is ciliated and at early stages of development, it's composed of two types of cilia. Uh, Emotile one highlighted here in orange and motai ones highlighted here in green. So those motai cilia will beat in a coordinated uh, fashion to generate a leftward flow in the embryonic uh, node like in the mouse or a counterclockwise flow in zebrafish, flow that we can visualize here thanks to the injection of fluorescent beads and uh, here thanks to the standard deviation of this movie. And at early stages of left-right uh, organizer development, the structure is mainly composed of emotile cilia that you can see here in blue. And as the structure grows, the emotile cilia will be slightly converted into a uh, motile one to mainly end up with motile one uh, at final stages of the LRO development. So in addition to this um, leftward flow, our group reported using genetically encoded calcium indicators, which are fluorescent reporters that allow us to visualize calcium dynamics at one of the earliest molecular events taking place to break the initial left-right symmetry where calcium oscillation in the cilia on the left side of the structure. Oscillation that we can visualize here on these uh, trays, which represent the variation of fluorescence over time. So those oscillations are periodic. They take place um, every two to five minutes. And they are mainly occurring between the one and four uh, somite stage. And they are mainly happening on the left uh, anterior side of the structure that we can see here on these rose diagrams. That is a spatial representation of the left-right organizer. And we also demonstrated using calcium buffers that those intracellular calcium oscillations were critical for proper left-right uh, development as if you block them, you lose the left-sidedness of the heart, meaning that instead of, and the, you lose proper lateralization. Um, and we also show that in addition 
so that those intracellular calcium oscillation rely on the cation channel polycysteine 2 or PKD2, as if you block the channel uh, using a morpholino or in a mutant for PKD2, you lose those oscillation. And losing those oscillation leads to complete randomization of the heart because the, the opposite of prolactarization is not a um, right-sided heart, it's just completely randomized, meaning that the heart, instead of being systematically on the left, will either be on the left, in the middle, or on the right side. And we also demonstrated that those oscillation, on top of requiring the polycystine 2 channel, they also rely on proper flow, as if you block the flow by paralyzing uh, ciliary motility, you lose the left-sidedness of this oscillation, and by losing the left-sidedness of this uh, oscillation, it also leads to complete randomization of the of of organ situs. So these results lead to the following questions. How are these left-sided intracellular calcium oscillation generated? And because they are taking place in the site of the LRO where uh, there is the highest amount of flow, which is on the left anterior side, we are making the hypothesis that LRO cilia are mechanosensors responding to the LRO flow. But to test this hypothesis, we needed a method to apply local and precise force on cilia. And typically to test mechanical sensation, artificial laminar flow has been used. But in this case, application of artificial laminar flow would not specifically allow us to target the cilium as it could, as it would also um, add some mechanical stimulation on the cell membrane. And it could also potentially transport chemical cues that would not allow us to decipher between mechanical sensation and chemical sensation. So we wondered whether we could apply an optical approach that would allow us to apply local control force and the cilium. And that's why we decided to use optical tweezers. So here I'm gonna briefly describe what optical tweezers are. So they're a biophysical tool that enables precise non-contact micromanipulation. So it's all optical, it's purely rely, uh, relying on light and it's basically just a very focused um, uh, laser beam. And that is capable of applying forces in the range of piconewtons and in the distance of nanometers. And that can hold a micron-sized uh, object. And it purely relies on the fact that light has momentums and as momentum and changes of light momentum generate optical forces. I'm going to show you here an example of how optical tweezers work. So when the laser that carries the optical tweezer is off, you can see that the beads are just drifting by Brownian motion. But the second you turn the trap on, you can see that the bead gets stuck in the trap. And when you move the stage, the bead stays in the optical trap. And the second we will turn it off, the bead will start to drift again. So here I'm showing you a couple of examples. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry, my computer is overheating. So I think that the video will be displayed at a lower frequency and I apologize about that. But so here, just showing you a couple of examples of how optical tweezers uh, can work um, in cell culture with the two movies on the side and in vitro, in vivo with the movie in the middle. So here, just to highlight how optical tweezers are a great tool to apply local force in a tunable manner. So the cilia here are not moving unless you turn on the optical trap. And here I would like to bring your attention to this movie to show how versatile this approach is, as you can choose and change the frequency of oscillation uh, as illustrated here on this chemograph, which is a graphical representation of spatial uh, distribution over time. So here you can see on, the, on this chemograph that when the optical trap is off, the cilium is not moving, but the second you turn the optical trap on, you can change the position of the cilium. And when you change the frequency of oscillation of the trap, you're also changing the frequency of oscillation of the cilium to demonstrating how tunable and versatile this approach is. So we decided to combine optical tweezers with light sheet microscopy for gentle and fast imaging of ciliary calcium dynamics over time. So we built a setup that we decided to call Cilius Spot for a ciliary selective plane illumination microscope with optical tweezers. And uh, we came up with a, like, a fancy name because that's uh, what you need to do for branding, I suppose. So here, very briefly, the optical tweezer is highlighted in red, the light sheet is highlighted in uh, blue, and we're just mounting the embryo in a noodle of agarose, and we having the left right organizer in focus. You can see the cilium here, and the idea is for the cilia to express 
a genetically encoded calcium indicator here, GCAM6, with a red fluorophore that allows us to do racial metric measurement and to apply the optical tweezers on top of them to test whether they're cilia, uh, they're mechanosensors. So we're looking at the ability of cilia to respond to the mechanical opto stimulation in a context where there is no endogenous flow um, that could bias our results. So here, to get rid of the endogenous flow, we are paralyzing cilia first, meaning that the cilia are not moving. There is no flow in the LRO. So the cilia are here only moving when we come and bend them with the optical tweezer. So let's see here whether cilia can respond to the mechanical simulation. So first the laser is off. And when you start moving it, you will see that it leads to a huge increase of, um, of calcium within the cilium in response to the mechanically um, imposed stimulation with the optical tweezer. You can see here the onset of the response in this chemograph. And I'm showing you here a different movie to show you that when you bend the cilium for a long time, you will see repeated uh, re repeated responses within the cilium, recapitulating what we see endogenously, which is multiple increases of uh, ciliary signaling over time. So now that we see that cilia can respond to the mechanical simulation, we were facing a bit of a hurdle, which is to, uh, like the way, what, how do we analyze those data? And for those of you who are familiar with calcium imaging, um, you can know how um, tedious this can be, as it typically, um, requires us to draw region of interest over time to capture the variation of fluorescence over time. But in this case, it was a bit tedious to do as the cilium is moving and we need to draw a region of interest on multiple frames. And each of our recordings represented more a hundred of frames because we were recording at the seven hertz frequency for at least a couple of minutes for each uh, cilium. So instead of having to do those um, drawing those region of interest uh, manually, we decided to take advantage of uh, AI and machine learning. And we uh, developed a tool called Cilinet, which is uh, in summary, an automated way to extract those fluorescence intensity changes over time by automatically drawing a region of interest on top of the moving cilium for each frame. So we need to train the machine first, but you can see here that the machine's doing a pretty good job at recapitulating what we fed it first. So in all, the input is those movie uh, with those variation of fluorescence over time. And the output is the machine drawing a mask on top of the cilium and extracting those changes of fluorescence over time that are highlighted here in this tray. So here to show you the response of the previous, uh, the previous movie that I showed you earlier, the orange arrow represents the start of the simulation. So after, Simulating the cilium, you can see that the cilium is responding to the optically induced uh, stimulation multiple times after we start. So here is the GCAM signal representing the variation, the variation of the GCAM fluorescence over time, and you can see that this um, is not happening in the red um, in the red channel. And you have the ratio metric trace here showing the response of the cilium after we start uh, optically bending it with the optical tweezer. We determine and we observe that. The cilium started to respond after about 35 bends, after a displacement of about 2.4 micrometer and an angle, angle displacement of 30 degrees. But worth mentioning as well, we also observed that all the cilia in the LRO, regardless of the location, either on the left or on the right side, were all capable of responding to the optical um, stimulation, meaning that all cilia in the structure have the inherent ability to respond to uh, mechanical stimulation, and they are all true mechanosensors, but we mainly observe uh, those oscillations on the left side of the structure because that's the side of the structure that receives the highest amount of, of flow and force. So we also notice that on top of seeing responses in the cilium, we could also see uh, responses in the cell connected to the cilium and also to the rest of the mesendoderm. You can see here, you will see first an increase in the cilium and then in the rest of the cells. Responses highlighted here, you first have a response in the cilium and then in the cells connected to it. And with the quantification here, that the cells are pretty silent when there is no bending, but the second you start bending the cilium, the neighboring cell also start uh, responding to the uh, mechanical stimulation. Showing here that 
that the cilia here by the mean of calcium intake and release are the gates between the flow and the rest of the embryo to ensure proper left-right uh, patterning. So next, we investigated the molecular machinery that underlies cilia, uh, cilia mediated mechanical sensation. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, those endogenous uh, intracellular calcium oscillation rely on the polycystine two channel. So I reproduced those um, mechanical opti stimulation in the absence of the PKD2 channel. And you can see here that when you do not have the polycystine 2 channel, the you have a significantly lower um, response to the optical stimulation, meaning that the cilia need PKD2 to respond to the optical tweezer induced um, stimulation. And you can see it here also on those rose diagram that you have those oscillation when you're bending cilia that have the PKD2, but that you're losing those responses in the absence of the channel. Uh, strongly supporting a role for polycystine 2 as a mechanosensitive uh, calcium channel in the LRO cilia. So now, although our results demonstrate that intracellular calcium oscillation uh, trends uh, and are activated by mechanical force. They're not really showing whether this process is necessary uh, and sufficient for left-right development. So to test whether LRO ciliary mechanical sensation is sufficient to um, drive proper left-right patterning, we decided to um, do the following experiment. We're in a structure with cilia Again, like the LRO is a multiciliated st like structure. They, it contains about 70 cilia, but in this structure of about 70 cilia, we decided to tweeze in embryos that have paralyzed cilia. So we're paralyzing the cilia first, only one cilium on the left side to know whether, to determine whether this would be sufficient to uh, rescue proper laterality. So we decided to do this experiment uh, at the stages where we observed the highest um, amount of intra intracellular calcium oscillation, which is between the one and four somatic stage. And these um, developmental stages are occurring during a one hour um, window. So here, just to briefly summarize, in a structure where cilia are paralyzed, we decided to bend only one cilium for one hour between the one and four somatic stage to determine whether this would be sufficient to rescue lateralization. In, uh, in the embryos. So here to walk you through the quantification, in normal embryos, you should have proper lateralization, meaning the heart should always be uh, on the left side of the, of the body. In embryos with paralyzed cilia, you have complete randomization because you need proper left-right organizer flow for proper lateralization. But in embryos that have paralyzed cilia, when you tweeze, one cilium, only one cilium for one hour, you can rescue proper lateralization and drive the heart on the left. Strongly demonstrated that LRO ciliary mechanical sensation is instructive for left-right patterning. So knowing that now you can rescue proper lateralization, bending only one cilium on the left side, can you do the opposite and drive lateralization on the right side by bending one cilium on the right side. So we decided to do that, bend one cilium on the right side to see whether you could force lateralization on the other side. And we could indeed force lateralization on the right side by bending only one cilium for an hour, strongly demonstrating that ciliary mechanical sensation is, is sufficient for proper left-right patterning. So we also, did this experiment in the absence of the polycystine two channels. As I told you, the uh, endogenous intracellular calcium oscillation in the LRO require the polycystine two channel and cilia mechanical sensation in, is also requiring the channel. So when you do this rescue experiment in the absence of PKD2, we couldn't rescue um, proper lateralization, meaning that the PKD2 is critical for LRO mechanical sensation and for proper left-right patterning. So if you want to know and get more details about this work, I would invite you to um, check the publication um, that we released last year with more details. So now to summarize, second together, our results highlight the fact that cilia are calcium-mediated mechanical sensors that sense and translate flow into calcium signal that instruct left-right patterning. 
we're showing that auxiliary, auxiliary mechanical bending of LR cilia results in ciliary calcium influxes, that the polycystine 2 channel is required for ciliary mechanical sensation, that LR auxiliary sensing is necessary, sufficient, and instructive for proper left eye asymmetry. But it's also showing that optical tweezers are a powerful tool to probe the role of biomechanical forces uh, during development. So our ongoing work is to try to decipher further uh, the molecular machinery responsible for ciliary mechanical sensation. And we're trying to determine the role of PKD1 like one in the system, which is a binding partner uh, of PKD2 in the left right organizer. We're also trying to understand how ciliary mechanical sensation is transduced from the cilium to the cell body. But beyond the symmetry, I'm also interested in understanding uh, the role and the function of ciliasmic endosensors in other tissues and developmental processes, and especially in the heart itself, as we see that cilia are there in the developing heart, but they are also disappearing as the heart grows and mature. And that's something that I want to focus uh, on next. So with that, I'd like to thank um, the people in my lab, especially Sheru uh, Yuan for being a very supportive mentor. I'd like to also thank the collaborators that contributed to this body of work. Uh, I'd like to also thank the company of biologists and the development uh, pathway to independence program and organizers for giving us this uh, wonderful opportunity to grow and to learn how to transition from our current position to an independent position. And I would also like to thank uh, Alex for chairing our session today. And uh, with that, I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Lydia. I think that's a really beautiful demonstration of using modern technology to address a fundamentally classical bio developmental biology question. So please don't be shy, use the Q&A box uh, to ask any questions. And while you're thinking about your questions, I'll start off with a couple. Um, so my first question is about the topology of the left-right organizer. Is it sort of, what shape is it? And why do you get more force on the left-hand side than the rest of the structure where flows could be potentially equal around the whole, around the whole node? So the structure kind of differs between species, but in the zebrafish, it looks like a whoopee cushion. It's more like that. And um, you have the dorsal side and the ventral side that are more like kind of flat. And arguably, you have potentially an initial asymmetry in the way the cilia are actually organized within the structure. So not that's not something that we are very focusing on, but that's definitely... Um, a place where more work could be done to know and determine what is actually shaping the left-right organizer the way it is. Because this leftward flow is also generated this way thanks to the way the cilia are distributed within the, the structure. Cool, thank you. We have a question from Natalia Shiloh. Hi, Natalia. Um, she asks, do we know how the subsequent calcium waste stays restricted to the left of the embryo, or does it transverse across the midline? So, I didn't really mean, I didn't really um, focus on the waves that are in the cytosol. I mainly focus on the cilia per se. But yes, when you actually look at the endogenous uh, waves, not manipulating the system, you have mainly those uh, waves on the left side. So that's work that has been done even before me. So you do some see some of those uh, waves on the right side, but the majority of those uh, calcium oscillation within the cytosols are within the cytosols are actually on the left side yeah thank you and so how do we know whether they're yeah so i guess that they are mainly restricted on this side thanks to the fact that those initial cues are mainly taking place in the left side uh, yeah okay thanks i've actually got a second question which is the sensitivity of your system i mean it's really impressive that you can create actuality with a single cilia how closely does what you're manipulating recapitulate what's seen in terms of the oscillatory rate of the flow or the mechanical sensing they'll be experiencing in vivo. So yeah, something I didn't have the time to show is that uh, I looked at the endogenous dynamics um, by uh, DIC imaging to see how cilia were moving. Um, and I could see that on the right and the left side, they weren't. So I'm doing stages at the developmental stage when cilia are mainly emotile. But mm -hmm. despite the fact that they're not beating per se, they are subjected to some type of displays displacement. And I characterize that um, by looking at them uh, with the IC. And you can see that they are kind of like slowly drifting at the one hertz frequency, which is why I de we decided to bend them at the one hertz uh, mm -hmm. frequency as well. And uh, we also saw that this 
like despite the fact that they were still on the two sides were subjected to this frequency, the one on the left side were seemed to just be uh, subjected to a higher angle of displacement. So I think that the angle of displacement is also important to trigger that type of response. Thank you. Another question from Natalia. Yeah. Do you also see asymmetric distribution of polycysteine 2 within cilia as being reported in mice? Yeah, so I didn't do those experiments myself. So I did some PKE2 staining, uh, and PKE2 is expressed in all the cilia, but regarding the distribution of the channel within the cilia itself, I didn't do so like a super resolution to uh, look whether this uh, distribution was as uh, demonstrated in the mouse. So no, I didn't do that. But I'm pretty sure this is going to come out uh, soon from another mm -hmm. group. Yeah. Okay. 